back a little bit, but we could probably, we could probably, <laughs> I know there's only so friendly we can get right now, but. Well, it's a happy, happy Sabbath for me. At 8.55 this morning, we had grandkid number six, little girl, about eight pounds. So eight, about, they haven't really measured her yet, but they think she's around eight. So, yeah, so Sherry was up until like 2 or 2.30 last night because they thought it was close. She couldn't go to bed, and then she couldn't sleep, and now she's, now she's like on baby duty. <laughs> so... He said, no point in me going to church. I can't concentrate. <laughs> Have any other praises or prayers? I'm just thankful we can still be here today. We haven't gotten everything shut down yet. So thankful that we've got a, some vaccines on the way, and maybe pretty soon we can get back to normal, whatever normal was. <laughs> Why don't we have a word of prayer and then we'll get started because we're going to be a little bit short today because of, of the time restrictions are under, but have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath morning where we can gather together and study your word. And Lord, it's your word, your inspiration we want this morning. Guide us each, guide me as I speak, guide those who hear. Let us all uh, somehow draw closer and draw inspiration from this study this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, we're on lesson number 11, the Christian and work. Our memory text says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immobile, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I kind of underline that last part because um, it could have ended that with saying your labor is not in vain. But your labor can be in vain if it's not in the Lord, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter what career you have or what work you do or what labor you perform throughout your life. You're only going to be here so long and then you're gone. You know, the nails you pounded, they're going to rust away. The house you built is going to eventually crumble you know, the only thing really eternal you're going to leave is the work you're doing for God. The souls that you help reach that will be there in heaven for eternity. That's your, that's the real work. I'm going to be so glad to not have these. <laughs> And barely see my. So, I've written down that there were three things that God established at the very beginning before the fall. Three things that came over after the fall and that still exist today. Does anybody have an idea what those are? Works, one of them. <laughs> we we're talking about that, the Sabbath. Marriage, yep. All three of those are still in effect today, aren't they? You know, work was given to Adam in the garden before the fall to be a blessing, wasn't it? Have you ever thought of your work as a blessing? Yeah, I mean, I got laid off the first of November and just started work again this Monday. And that period in between, I thought, man, I'm not ready for retirement. I just I don't know what I'd do with 
sitting around. I don't like not having things to do. You know, there's always stuff to do around the house, but you don't feel that productive value, I guess, doing that. But you know, one of these days maybe I'll be ready for retirement, but not yet. I've heard that. <laughs> Have you ever heard the, the statement, idle hands are the devil's playground? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really come, it's not really biblical, mm -hmm. it's not a statement that's actually in the Bible, but it kind of, you could probably say it kind of comes loosely from 1 Timothy 5.13. Five thirteen. It says, at the same time, they also learn to be idle, as they go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. So, this was talking about a group of women here, that widows and things. But same thing, I think, applies to everybody. You know, you tend, when you don't have something that's occupying you and keeping you busy, these are the kind of things that tend to creep in, aren't they? That gossip and talking about things you shouldn't really be talking about instead of doing the right things. Yeah, I think we kind of hit a perfect storm there. You know, we had the Black Lives Matter thing going on, then we had all the unemployment going on with the COVID layoffs, and then, you know, just all kind of gelled together, and you had a lot of people probably that weren't working and just looking for something to do. What were some of the, let's turn to Genesis for a minute and, and look at that and see what were some of the things that changed, do you think, once sin entered in the differences in work that was to be done? Because God said, he told Adam, didn't he? He said, you're, you're to tend the garden or to cultivate the garden. But after sin, he said, now, now you're going to labor in the sweat of your brow. Now the earth's going to bring forth thorns and weeds and all these things that you're going to have to work at harder now to tend to. But do you ever stop sometimes and think what was the tending of the garden like before all that? Can you imagine tending your garden and never having to pull a weed? Never having to go out there with the rototeller and go down the rows and get the weeds out, spray for weeds, all those things that we have to do now. And I think the, I think the earth was completely different. I think those plants brought forth their bounty with very little assistance from Adam. He, his tending of the garden was probably more like going out and harvesting the bounty that it produced. You know, maybe the, the flowers when you picked them didn't even wither and wilt. Or maybe you didn't even, why would you even want to pick them? They'd be growing everywhere. You wouldn't really need to pick them and bring them in on, to put on your centerpiece on your table, would you? Because 
they'd be all blended. And then think about that's that's what God wants to restore this earth to that kind of balance of nature again. Well, Sunday says, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to good to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. That's from Ecclesiastes 3.12. So being able to work and get satisfaction and joy out of what you've done, that's a gift from God. I mean, I'm sure you've probably all heard the old saying, if you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I think there's a lot of truth in that one. You know, sometimes we get, you get those jobs that you just really love and you can't, it's, it's not a, toil to get up and go to work in the morning. You, you look forward to the day. And, and then sometimes you get those jobs where it's like, man, do I really have to go again? What's going to happen today? Yeah, we're not, we're not going, the new earth is going to be the new earth. It's going to be restored to what it was when it was first created, not what sin did to it. The same thing with our bodies. It says we're going to be transformed. We're going to get new bodies. Those bodies are going to be more designed like they should have been at creation, not the effects of sin that have degraded us now. I had so much stuff underlined in this bottom side of Sunday. I'm just going to read the whole thing because it's pretty good. It says, Suddenly the work given before the fall changes after the fall. Here in reference to another side of work, for some work means only the drudgery of daily toil, which will end with death. You know, and there's a lot of people today that are working those kinds of jobs like we just talked about. Oh man, did the alarm clock go off? I just I have to get up and go to that job again. You know, they just dread going to their job. It said they labor on in jobs that they despise, hoping to retire when they still have their health. For others, work can even take over one's life, becoming the center of one's existence. 
even the all-encompassing source of one's personal identity away from their work. Have you ever met the workaholic? You know, that's what they're talking about here, the one that just can't stop. You know, even when they come home, you, they don't leave their work at the office. They bring it home with them. They, they probably wake up in the middle of the night thinking about things that they have to do the next day at work. You know, when there's family events going on, they, they'd rather be at work. They, you know, their whole priority in life is work, work, work. So Christians need to learn how to work God's way. Work is more than an economic necessity. Man is more than just an employee. Rightly understood, one's life work is an avenue of ministry, an expression of one's relationship to the Lord. And it says part of a teacher's task is helping students find the work where their skills and God-given interests intersect with the needs of the world. I, can't, I, I don't know if they still do this today in schools, but I remember when I was in school, we actually took these, what they would call, I think, a vocational interest exam. And it was supposed to be designed to show you what kind of jobs might you, you might be interested in, find fulfilling, or that you were... Uh, maybe not qualified for but because you're still obviously a student you haven't gone that far but you know, it was kind of an interesting process I think I don't know if they still do that today but um, that's kind of what it's talking about here with, with more like we're a little late in life to do this now but for younger students um, helping them to find that connection you know, some students, I mean, the kids you look at and you just say, man, that, that kid's got the intellect that would make a CPA or an engineer or a doctor or that kid would make a great policeman or firefighter. You know, you, you can usually get a feeling for these kind of things when you get to know these kids. And that's part of what it's saying here, that as a teacher, that's part of that job. Well, in, in a Christian school in general, is going to give you that that added component of using whatever your career is going to be. Is how am I going to use that for outreach as well? You know, the the public 
system can train you very well to work in the world, but there's no uh, religious component to it, no outreach, no no connection with God that's going to make your job more valuable in the service to the Lord. I think one thing also is that the students that have been making it harder and harder <laughs> for kids to work. Mm-hmm. And I think that you can teach your servers because when they are young, they can try on. Well, if you, I think if you even look back even, probably even to the time of the founding of America, but certainly before that, if your dad was a carpenter, you were probably going to be a carpenter, you know, and, and whatever that trade was that your parents were in, that's probably what you were going to do, you know, Jesus's earthly father was a carpenter, he was a carpenter. And, and I think in some respects that gave the kids that direction. But I think it also, um, when you just look at some of the architecture and things that were done you know, five, six hundred thousand years ago, and you look at some of the details that were put into buildings back then, we don't do that anymore. We don't just not do it because it's more expensive to do it. We don't do it because we've lost the skills. And I think a lot of those things were passed on generation to generation to generation, and now they're lost. I wanted to turn to Ecclesiastes 2 and go through verses 20 to 24. First time I read it, it sounded kind of like, well, this is all negative. But if you really look at what he's saying here, there's some guidance on how not to work. Verse 20, Ecclesiastes 2, says, Therefore I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored unto the sun, When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This, too, is vanity and great evil. So he's saying, you know, you're you're doing all this work here on earth, but somebody else is going to inherit the fruits of all that work. Someday you're going to perish. You know, the home you built is going to be somebody else's. Maybe the career you built is going to move to somebody else. The, the practice that you've established is going to be somebody else's. You know, it's all that part of work is not your, where you should be finding your fulfillment in life. 22 says, For what does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Because all his days his task is painful and grievous. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. What's he talking? He's talking about a workaholic here, isn't he? The man whose mind won't even rest at night. He's just, everything in his life is about work. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink And to tell himself that his labor is good, this also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. 
actually saying, do your work, enjoy your work, rejoice in the fruits of your work. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't look at your work as a burden. But he says you get that as a gift from God, right? So maybe if you're burdened and you're not enjoying your work and you just feel like it's a drudgery, maybe you need to get a spiritual connection again with God. Ask him to help you with that. Maybe there's an outreach there that you're ignoring. Yes, Mm-hmm. Most of the people that I work with a lot are enjoying their work. They're just getting paid for their work. And even though they're you know, free to take a long time to get to work, most of them are just tired of not doing it. But I run into a few people that are just kind of grumpy about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think logging is probably a really good example of how the things that you're doing now are probably going to benefit your children and grandchildren, not necessarily you. You know, your hope is that your grandfather or your father planted the trees so that you're reaping the benefit now. You know, it's farming is, I think, a little bit that way as well. Um, any job can be that way. You know, if you start a law firm, you know, or your, your kid decides to be a lawyer, he can inherit that. You know, it's, it's a sign of not being selfish in your work, I think. They were expected to tend and nurture the land, not rape and pillage it. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 16. Verse, I'm going to, this memory, this text has just verse 15, but I'm going to go back to verse 13. Deuteronomy 16, 13, it says, You shall celebrate the Feast of Booths seven days after you have gathered in from your threshing floor and your wine vat. So this is a celebration of the harvest, right? You've done all your farming or, or whatever it is you're doing and you've brought all the product in and it's done, the season's over, and you're going to have a seven-day celebration says, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your towns. So this is everybody, it pretty much encompasses everybody, right? This wasn't just because you and your family reaped a big harvest. This was everybody that participated in it everybody in the town that wanted to come and celebrate with you. It says, seven days you shall celebrate a feast to the Lord and your, the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and all the work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful. So you're celebrating the work of your hands. You know, I think he's saying it's important 
this celebration, I think, points to the fact that we're supposed to celebrate the fact that we've worked and that we've accomplished something and that we've reaped a good harvest or we've got a good paycheck or we've got a good job. Celebrate that because it's a blessing from God. Don't forget to celebrate that. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Um, the next lesson on work and excellence, I think, relates to that. The Proverbs 21.25 says, the, the desire of the sluggard brings him death because his hands refuse to work. So it seems like we have a big problem with that in society these days, don't we? Too many free rides, too many people that just don't want to work. I mean, it's really getting to the point, I don't know how many people in here have to hire people or, or work in HR or run their own business, but it's really gotten to the point today where somebody comes in breathing and says, I can go in tomorrow or today and pass a drug test and I'll show up for work every morning. You better just hire them. You know, worry about training them, do what you want them to do later because you've just overcome about 80% of the battle of finding workers today. Well, Jeremiah 116, if you, that kind of brings up another side to work. We shouldn't be worshiping what we've made, should we? Even though we're rejoicing in, in our accomplishments, rejoicing that God's blessed us with work, rejoicing in what we've been able to do, that doesn't mean we worship what we've done. And of course, part of remembering that God's involved in this keeps you from worshiping yourself. Keep you from being, so, oh, I know everything. I think the problem is one of the reasons you know, that they had the, the Last Supper in the, uh, uh, that's in the Celtic Record of Ours or whatever. Booth, yeah. Well, not, and I think the other part of that was inviting everybody else to participate, reminding you that this blessing you received from the harvest wasn't your hands. It was God's hands. Therefore, share that blessing with everybody around you. Two, we got a few minutes Tuesday talks about work and excellence. And in Exodus 25, 9, God's giving Moses the design for this tent in the wilderness. And it wasn't just to be, go put up some poles and a canvas tarp and call that my tent, was it? There's very specific things that God wanted Moses to do. I think there's like, what did they say, a list of a hundred and some directions 
for how to build the tent, how to do all the furnishings, everything that went into that tent. I kind of thought it was interesting too because it says it says just so you shall construct it and I don't know how many people deal with legal documents in here today but shall and will today have very specific legal connotations when it says you shall do this you know you're telling a contractor in a contract you shall do this that means this is part of the contract. There's no option. If you don't do this, you're not fulfilling the contract. On the reverse side, if you say, I will do something, then you're committing the same commitment in that contract. You know, this, this was more than just um, go build a tent in the wilderness. This was this is exactly how I want it done and you shall do it this way. And so Moses took this very seriously and did it, I think, with all of the might of his hands. He hired the best craftsmen to, in there to do it. He didn't just go bring in a shepherd to, to build to sew up a tent. He found the people that knew how to do it the furniture and everything that was made, he found the people that knew how to do it the right way. I think when I looked at that work and excellence, that doesn't mean work and perfection, does it? Perfection and excellence are a little different. You know, the, the Indian, native Indians have a habit when they make something, they put a flaw in it somewhere because they're like, we could make this garment perfect. We could make these beads or whatever they're making, uh, this moccasins, whatever they're gonna make, we could make it perfect. But we know that only God is perfect. So we put a flaw in there somewhere to remind us that we're not perfect. That doesn't mean they're not doing it to the best of their ability, so. You know, just because we're living in a fallen world and we're, we're under sin, that's not an excuse to not do things to the best of our ability. Especially as Christians, I think people look at us differently. I mean, I've heard stories of, of uh, employers that when they know you're a Christian, oh, okay, I'll put you in charge of the money you can take the deposits to the bank because you're supposed to be at a higher moral standard than everybody else. You're representing God in your work and people watch that too. Well, we're out of time. The red light's on we can bow our heads, we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these lessons and for these reminders that uh, even in our workplace, we are still doing your work. We are still reaching out to those in need. We're still looking for those opportunities to, to share your word, to share your gospel with others. Lord, we'd ask that uh, we'd always remember that our, our work is a way of spreading your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.